Right, yeah. Good morning. And then today is the new due date for the week three challenges. And then I shifted all the due dates for the uh, 11.95 p.m. So the, some of the students were confused that like that I put the uh, canvas calendar like that. But uh, I set the due date as a 10 a.m. Because like that, I wish like the students finish their homework before coming to the class. But I believe that doesn't actually matter. So like that, I shifted a little bit. So please take a little more time for that. And for the all extra credit challenges, I will let you uh, submit that the very last day before I need to make the grade. Yeah, make the, the letter grade for you. So like, please take enough time for the extra credit challenges. So you don't have to finish week two, week three extra credit challenges for now. And then whenever you feel like you need more points, then please do so. And also for the short shell code, I will ask on like the uh, March 8th. And then like the, you need to send me the direct message on that day with your object dump shell code with the flag as a, like the, uh, so how you can do is like that. I will give you like the, some of the instructions and then post on the web. Yeah. So basically you need to do run the challenge binary, uh, print the flag and then make object dump then like the, I can see the both flag and then like how many bytes are there. Yeah, then based on that, I will manually insert all the uh, credits as a word in the CDFD, yeah. That's the little bit of logistics. Any questions about that? And then another thing is like the from week four, five, six, seven, the challenges will be much uh, set with the much higher points. But that, that doesn't mean that the techniques uh, that we will use is sophisticated. So this class, uh, firstly, in the first three weeks, we teach some of the prerequisites to get on board to like the how to, to attack binary programs. And then like that, I put a lot of value on the playing with the real differences and avoiding that. So that's why I put a lot of efforts for that, a lot of points for that. So that actually means that uh, you can recover all the lost points from week one to three with, by doing well in week four, five, six. Yeah. And then uh, if you try the some of the DPA SRL challenges, so it requires a little bit of programming for like the uh, controlling input output from the target program. So that's just a uh, Python coding, not about the exploit Excel, right? And then the exploitation step will not be sophisticated uh, uh, from like the, not that different from like the week two or three. Yeah. Any questions for that part? And another thing is like that I created a grade menu. So for those who are not familiar with that, I want to show you that. So I need to share over Zoom. So at here, there's a grade menu, but you need to log in. But I didn't solve any challenges. So it says zero points or something. So that you can see the exact due date yeah, from here. And also you will have a score for the on time and then late challenges. And then it'll be automatically calculating all the score for you that. And then if there's any kind of error, please report that to me. And it will automatically calculate the expected letter grade, but is that that is based on the uh, total points released and then how many points you earned. So yesterday night, uh, I released a new challenge set with the uh, this much of points. So all your grades became like the C, D, F, but the don't get shocked. Yeah. And then, so I do not put, I do not wish to play, have you guys like the nervous about that. But uh, I wish you uh, feel some of the uh, fun moment to uh, whenever the letter grade changes. <laughs> yeah. So please regard that like that. Yeah. And then the currently the grade scale is set like this, but uh, I will adjust that. And then it always goes lower based on the your progress. And then I know that uh, you work hard on the challenges, and I value value that a lot. Yeah. But I always uh, make students aim high. Yeah. So that's why, but uh, uh, I will do my job at the end. So please don't worry much. But uh, if you solve just a 
half of the old challenge and I'm expecting getting A, uh, that is not the expectation. <laughs> yeah. Right, uh, let's start the topic for today. And we will learn the return oriented programming. And at the end of the, this lecture, you will realize that uh, you can solve all week four challenges using this technique. Yeah. So as I always told you, uh, I don't care about what kind of techniques you use. So if you wish, you can use this technique to solve the rest of challenges. Yeah, that's also okay. But uh, uh, the What's good is like the, if you learn specific techniques for stack cookie or DEP and ASRL, and then later that would be very helpful because like, uh, there are some cases that uh, you need to use combination of the techniques with the Rob and the them. Yeah. So what I wish is like the uh, use the specific technique that you learned for each week, but the, you don't have to do that. Yeah. So let's do very little recap about the defenses. We learned about the data execution prevention last week and how we can avoid that is, so even though we cannot jump on the shell code, we can call functions existing in the program. Yeah. So that's the so-called uh, return to libc. So whenever we compile a program with C language, libc will be there. And then the reason why we focus on libc is like libc includes the exact system and those kind of the interesting functions to hackers. So if there is, we can call any kind of function. So it is so-called code reuse attack. So not jumping to the shell code, code region is there. That's naturally executable. So hackers can reuse that. It's quite free for that. And then in today's lecture, return oriented programming is all based on the code reuse attack. We will just reuse the code existing in the library or code area, but uh, we are not reusing functions. We will jump in the middle of the functions and then we will just reuse a part of that. And then you will see that uh, that's quite neat to call any kind of function uh, in with the like your stack configuration. So that's why it is called the return oriented programming. And then we learned about stack cookie and stack cookie to solve that, it requires an information leak. What that means is that uh, if we can leak the four byte or eight byte value from the stack canary, then we can overwrite the same value before overwriting the return address then they can never detect attack has happened or not. Yeah. So that's the technique we will use for avoiding stack cookie. And even if there is no direct information leak, uh, the example of the stack cookie three was, uh, I don't know why, <laughs> who hacked this one? <laughs> it gets completely weird. <laughs> Maybe I need to reset entire system. Yeah. Let's take a little break about 30 seconds. <laughs>
can everybody join the Zoom link? <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, it works. So it works for the this computer. What about this one? Trust me, I didn't hack anything. <laughs> Right. Uh, please join to the Zoom room to watch the slide. Yeah. This is weird. Yes. So everybody ready? Yeah, right, let's go. Yeah. So we can use side channel attack. And then the example was set cookie three challenge. It uses fork internally. So whenever we do fork on the server side, the stack entry value will all same for the old children. So we can use that information to check whether the error message contains the stack entry smash it or not. So based on that one bit information, we can step-by-step -step hack it with the 1024 or 2048 trials. And then another trick is like the stack entry will always start with zero bytes for the first one. So the entropy for the stack canary in 32-bit is just three bytes. So two to the 24. And then the reason is uh, this is so-called ASCII armor. So if you have, if you can only insert like ASCII input uh, for something like a string input uh, for some of the functions. So for example, if the function is scan up or something, so you cannot put zero bytes in there. So that will naturally block the attack uh, sourcing from the string uh, or related functions. And that's because like the most of the evil source of the buffer overflow in 1990 something was like the always string copy. It does not have a side check at all. So they do the practical measure for the uh, stack canary for having zero bytes at the start. So always guess the first byte of the stack canary as a zero. That is quite safe for the Linux systems, but the, some other systems have a different uh, stack entry. Yeah. And then the, another thing about the we can avoid the stack cookie is stack cookie can only defeat sequential buffer overflow. So stack cookie four, that challenge has the loop variable to index some of the buffer. And then if you can, uh, if you play with the, that variable, then you can skip the stack canary part and then directly overriding the return address. So like the, I would like to teach like the, some various, uh, some of the various skills that you can avoid the uh, stack canary attack in yeah, many ways. So please memorize that. And then uh, challenges in week six and seven may require that because in week five, there's no stack canary because that's just for uh, practicing the return-oriented programming with the simple buffer overflow. Yeah. From 
from week six, seven, and then the in-class CTF at the end, I will enable all the protections. So, but the, don't worry much. So if you thoroughly learn about all the uh, things well, then you know how to avoid H by H, then uh, you will see that the, you are accomplishing a lot at the end. And then the, another difference was ASRL. Uh, address space layout randomization is for randomizing the address layout per each execution. So it also requires information leak about the where's the address of the buffer or where's the address of the library functions or BinSH strings. So we need to find that. But even if we cannot directly find some of the uh, addresses for target object, if we know the address of the region, then the, all the relative offset is fixed. So that, that is the important part. And by leaking just one address from each region, then we can know about the layout of the entire uh, address space. So in the most of cases, for a successful exploit, uh, you only need one leak in the most cases. So you can think of ASRL made hackers to find two vulnerabilities. One is a buffer overflow, and the other is that we need to find the information leak yeah, to launch the buffer overflow attack. So these are the implications and then the, some of the techniques that we can avoid the defenses. Uh, any questions? And let's move on. So uh, in around the 2014, so although those defenses are available early 2000s or something, so many systems didn't enable the ASRL or some of the systems didn't enable the data execution prevention uh, due to the compatibility issue. So some of the operating system, they don't like uh, their customers complaining about that. And then com customers complaining about that their performance degraded if they uh, cannot use some of the feature, and then that collides with the ASRL, DEP. Yeah. So these are not standard out there. But starting from 2014, uh, I believe that all the modern devices, including less laptop, desktop, server computers on the cloud, and even for the mobile phones, they all enabled uh, stack cookie, DEP, ASRL. Yeah. So we, although we have learned that the techniques of uh, breaking each by each, so in the real world, uh, you need to avoid all the defenses and then you need to mix and match all the techniques to do that, yeah. And return-oriented programming is the one of the way that you can avoid all the defenses yeah, like that. And before starting the return-oriented programming, uh, so you can think of return-oriented programming as like the uh, avoiding defense about the DEP and ASRL at the same time. Yeah. And you have seen that the DEP challenges, uh, you need to return to the library functions and you need to know uh, to do that, you need to know where the library functions are located. So that means you need to know the exact address or some of the base address of libc or any kind of function address in libc uh, to do that. And how we can get the address is like that we can launch GDB and then print about those functions, calculate the offset. And if the address is randomized, we need to leak the one of the address and then calculate the randomized address out of it. But the, there is a one weaknesses in ASRL. So I introduced that there are two versions of the binary program with the ELF, read the ELF headers. And then one side, if they say EXEC, then that's a binary program that their code addresses are fixed. So although library stack heap, those regions are randomized by kernel kernels uh, settings of the ASRL, the code address of the program itself is not randomized. So that's so-called partial ASRL. And in these days, uh, we do not have this kind of the partial ASRL because uh, binary, because like uh, that's the weakest link in the system. 
So to protect the system from the attacks, uh, modern systems are enabled all the position independent executable. But there are some cases still there. And then like the, in this week, all the challenges are not enabled with the position independent executable. So we are practicing the world at around 2014. So it's quite close. So we were talking about the 1998 or 2003, but the, now we are at the 2014. And then we will get to 2023 <laughs> at week seven and then uh, week eight or something. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this is a result of the command called on checksack. So in our VMCTF123 server, I can I will demonstrate that later uh, with the tutorial. If you type PWN space check stack space and then binary name, and then it will summarize that what kind of security mechanisms are applied to current binary program. And then if that result in no PIE, that means the code address of the binary program is always fixed. But that's for the, their own code, not about the libc. Yeah. And then full ASRL means that uh, there is no reason, no reason for like having a fixed address for that. So even for the code address of the program, that will be randomized. And then in that case, it will have a PIE enabled. Yeah. So we will learn how to break the DP and ASRL at the same time on non-PIE binaries uh, in this week. Yeah. And then uh, we will learn how to get a shell out of that. So let's start with the first challenge. Uh, there is a challenge called the ROP 132 and ROP 164. So these two challenges are conceptually the same. But the 32-bit is just the 32-bit and 64-bit is just 64-bit. And the reason why we need to learn two set of the thing at the same time is that their argument passing is different. Yeah. So the, we will chain unlimited number of function calls. So in DEP3, I show that on the slide that we can chain three calls of the function. And then that requires some of the lucky combination about that. But uh, we will learn about the chaining arbitrary number of function calls uh, with the buffer overflow attack. And in this challenge, I specifically ask you to write your stack to run set regid with the specific GID number that you need to get. So that will be 50,000 for ROP132, 50,001 for ROP164. So you need to call this function first and then exec the bnsh00. And then in ROP132, uh, I kindly insert some of the location of the exec ve and set regid in a fixed location. So even if your stack heap or other memory regions are got randomized, uh, every time you will execute the program, uh, the ease function address will be fixed. Yeah. So you can actually the call exact VE with the uh, this uh, <clears throat> by uh, just uh, returning to these kind of the uh, functions. And then. Let's learn about how can we chain function calls and then how we did that in DEP3. So in DEP3, uh, we actually need to run, open a file, read the flag, and print the flag. And the reason why I create this sum function is that open system call requires a three arguments. And then if you put three arguments, then that will be on the this part and that part and that part. And you cannot call printf and then that will collide with the read arguments. So yeah, there is a constraint and you cannot easily do that. So I intentionally put the sum function. So you need to create the sim link to a.txt as a flag. Yeah, so that kind of trick is required. But 
let's run a, uh, let's recap about like the, how we exploit this one. So your ESP will be at here at the time to return. So it will return to some function. So it will execute that. After that, if the sum function returns, it will return to read function. And then that will invoke read. Uh, so I will skip this part. Yeah. And then this, so after that, it will return to read function. Then that will invoke read three buffer and size. So that's how we invoke this function. And then after read returns, it returns to the printf. And then luckily, the first argument of printf is the address of the buffer. So that's why chaining three calls works. So the constraint is that the first function call, it does not have any kind of argument. And then second function calls the second argument is the same as the third function calls the first argument. Yeah. So this design, uh, this challenge is designed to be like this. So that's why you can call three functions as a chain. Yeah. Now, any case questions about up to this point? Then we will learn about that how we can run arbitrary functions in arbitrary numbers of the chain. Yeah, with the new technique called the return-oriented programming. Yeah. So the reason why it is called as a return-oriented programming is that uh, think about the CPU. So they do have fetch, decode, execute that kind of pipeline. And then fetch the code and execute. Fetch the code, execute, and in doing that. We write the assembly code and then changing that to upcode some of the bytes and then run it. But in return oriented programming, you can think of the buffer overflow vulnerability turn into a special virtual CPU that it will get these kind of the stack values as an instruction. Then return is actually fetch and it will run accordingly over the stack. So the, we can think of like the, this kind of the stack is actually the programming language for the buffer overflow return machine. Yeah. And it's okay to, you are not getting what's the implication of that. So I believe like after solving two to three challenges, you will immediately feel that like, oh, this is actually the programming language. Yeah. Then, I told you about like we can chain arbitrary number of the uh, functions, and then let's see how we can do that. So the challenge is that we need to call set regid 50,000, 50,000, and then exec be bnsh. And to do that, the first thing we can do is we can set the first return as a set regid and their first argument as a 50,000, second argument as a 50,000. So we can easily call this one. But when we get to call exec VE, so we need to put exec VE here. And then if we call this, what is the first argument of the exec VE? So that's the 50,000, this one, yeah. But we don't wish to have that. That's a, not a valid address at all. And then we want to put the address of the BNSH. So the technique that we will learn today is like how we can put the argument correctly, even under this kind of condition. So we cannot chain multiple functions by just having this kind of construction, but Let's think about what we can do. So the, one of the constraints that we have is like, we must call set regid 50,000, 50,000 first. Yeah. Then one of the fact is that after running set regid, it will return to the next location. So the question is, where should we return for this? position of the stack to get the chance that we can run exactly. So that, that's the thing we will run today. And then 
this is very simple and easy. Yeah. So at the return, it will run set regid with the two fifty thousand, and then what if we return to the location that the code has the instructions to the pop r evi pop ebp and return. So the reason why I have a, like a, this kind of example is that you can find that these kind of the assembly snippets at the end of the function very frequently. It's all about leave return or like pop, pop, pop register and return. That's the standard for the function after log. So we can easily find these kind of the gadgets for the assembly. And then if we return to the, in the middle of the function like this, we can actually chain the function call. Then let's take a look. So suppose we return to where the pop pop return is at, then it will pop 50,000, pop, pop 50,000 again. So it will change the value of the EDI and EBP, but we don't care. And then at the return, where it should return exactly and then we can freely set any kind of argument at here right so the rule is very simple if you want to call a function if it has a zero argument there's no requirement of the pop instruction just put the another function address if you have one argument pop return and then another function address if you have two arguments pop pop return, then another function address. Three arguments, pop 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 return, yeah. And then you can easily find around the six pop and returns in the program's uh, assembly code. Yeah, so up to six arguments, so there will be no problem for chaining the uh, functions. And then there are some other techniques that you can move the stack a lot. The technique is called the stack pivot. Uh, we will learn about that later. Yeah. So technically and theoretically, uh, there is a no limit uh, of like that you can uh, call functions and about the number of arguments and how many functions. So this is the technique. Any questions at this point? So basically, we are removing the arguments that blocks us to put the arguments freely for the next function. So we will put the pop pop return to pop these two and then make the return chain goes through. So this is the map of the what we will do. So if there's a one argument for the function, we will compose the stack as a pop return, then it will call right next function. Pop pop return, next function. Pop, 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 then next function. Yeah. So th that's the basic. And then, so hackers calls uh, these are uh, the pop, pop something as a uh, Rob gadgets. Because we, we should have those kind of gadgets to uh, successfully attack the binary program. And there are some of the tools that automatically finds those kind of the addresses for you. So, Bless you. Yeah. If you run Rob gadget dash dash binary and then this binary program, then it will print out all the gadgets that you can use. Yeah. But uh, these are written in Intel syntax. So syntax is a little different, but uh, you can just count the number of pops. So two pop and return, one pop and return, three pops in return. You can easily find those kind of things. So please use this tool uh, when you try to tackle with the Rob challenges for week five. So to solve Rob 32, so from the Rob gadget, you will find that the two pops and return at the 0804865A as an address. So what you can do is put that address at the here, set regi ID, and then put the address of the exact V and then run it. So 
that's all okay for 32 bit because we pass arguments over the stack. So think about buffer overflow case. That gives the attackers that freely set any kind of values on the stack. So we can put the arbitrary values to the argument. So that's the easy case. But in 64 bit, the difference is that we need to put the argument at the register, not the stack. But what we can control is just the stack. Then how can you do that? So we need a different gadget for 64 bit. And then please memorize the order of the argument passing is RDI, RSI, RDX, RCX, and on. So passing argument via stack will never work. So we will use a different technique. So in 32 bit, we just focus on how many pops are there because the stack is the mainly used for passing arguments. But in 64 bit, we need to focus on the which register it will be popped out. Yeah. So we will mainly focus on that part for 64 bit. So there are some gadgets such as pop RDI and return. Then we can put arbitrary value on the stack, pop RDI. So it will set the value. If there's a gadget for pop RSI and return, then we can set the value of RSI. If there is a pop RDX in return, we can set the value of the RDX. And the reason why I only put three is that like, we only need three arguments for exact PE. Yeah. So we can do for all six arguments, but uh, just focusing on three things at this time. So if you run a ROP gadget for the 64 bit binary, you will see a slightly different result. So, because they are focusing on which register we pops out. So in 32 bit, it will not show, uh, there are many like the pop one register and return, but it will show only one gadget for that because we only need one gadget for popping out. But in 64 bit, there could be, even if like number of pops are similar, same the same, uh, it will have a uh, different registers and these are all printed out. So for example, if we put the return address as this one, then it will pop the value to RDI and return. So we can set the value of the first argument. And then, so this one, pop RSI, R15 and return. So if we put two values, then pop RSI, pop R15. So we can set both of R15 and RSI, but we will ignore the value to RSI, R15 because we will focus on setting the second argument by setting the RSI. And then for the third argument, we need to have pop RDX, RBP return, then we don't care about the RBP, but we will focus on the setting the value of the RDX. But the interesting thing here is that the, for the challenges uh, from ROP1 to ROP5, uh, I intentionally insert pop RDX as a gadget because our compilation process will never insert that for you. So I intentionally make the challenges easier for from ROP1 to ROP5, but in ROP6, there's no pop RDX, but you need to figure out how to set the third argument. And then uh, some of you cannot get like the, how difficult it is, but you will realize that in the next lecture. <laughs> but I will guide you step-by-step, step, don't worry about that. So it requires like a little sophisticated uh, thing about the playing with the assembly. So you will never regret about like playing with the shellcode writing and then reverse engineering because you need to use that technique in that challenge. So let's take a look at how that works visually. So in 32-bit, we call the function first. But in 64-bit, we need to set the, our argument first and then call the function. So to call set regid, 
what we need to do is like setting the argument first. So we will first return to pop RDI and return and put the first argument like this. Then it will pop RDI. So pop this value and set RDI as a 50,001. And then it will return to pop RSI R15 and return. So pop RSI, it will sell 50,001 to RSI. And then we don't care about the second value. You can put zero, one, any kind of value. That will set R15 and then return and return to set regi ID. So in 32 bit, return to the function first and, and then arguments are on the stack. Then in 64 bit, you need to set all the argument first and then return to the function. So that that's the difference. And then this is uh, this function call. So how can you get exec V after that is, so we will do the same thing. Set the first argument, pop RDI and return. Then that will pop address of the bin SH or address of A or any kind of string in the program. And then pop RSI R15 return. So set as a zero and then pop RDX and return. Set that as a zero and then return to exec B. Any questions about the 64-bit part? Let's move forward. So you can regard this chunk of a block starting from pop RDI to set regid. That as a one function call. And then we can have another chunk of a block from pop RDI to pop RSI, RDX, and exec V. That is a second chunk of a block. So can you feel that theoretically, we can create any function call with this kind of the stack values and then chain it with the arbitrary numbers, right? So this is why that this, this is the reason why it is called as a return oriented programming. And then you can think of set rigid ID 50,001, 50,001, that kind of the syntax is this kind of the stack configuration. So this is why I mentioned that the your stack will become a programming language. Yeah. So that is about the ROP1 challenge. And then in ROP2 challenges for both 32 and 64 bit, it will require you to call, open, read, write three function calls in chain by setting all the arguments. So it is very similar to DEP3, but it requires you to open the file by yourself. And to do that, you need to flush out all the arguments or you need to set all the arguments in 64-bit yeah, to launch that. And then, when you play with the challenges, then you will realize that the, the reason why I created all the DEP challenges in 32-bit, because for 64-bit to set the argument, you need to know the concept of the return-oriented program. Yeah. So this tool, Rob Gadget, will be the best friend of you. So please use this tool a lot on the server uh, to find the gadget. And then, I released uh, 11 challenges. So six set up like the uh, 3264 of like the ROP challenges. And then the, in the next lecture, I will introduce how we can solve ROP 3, 4, 5, 6. Yeah. And then we just uh, go over, went over like the how to solve the ROP 1 and 2. Yeah. And these are the challenge descriptions. And then the important thing is that the from now on, uh, for the week five, six, seven, and another challenges, we will use the VMCTF2 server. And the reason why I keep changing the server is VMCTF1 is like a server on the before 2000 year, uh, year of the 2000. And then VMCTF3 is simulating the ASRL in 32-bit. 
So simulating 2005, six, that kind of year. And then BMC TF2 is simulating uh, 2014 and onward. Uh, that's why. So the, I also put like the, in the challenges description in the set TFD, uh, where the host uh, challenge is hosted. So please keep that in mind. So if you cannot find the challenge that then you are in the wrong server. Yeah. So please use the correct server. And then if you have a trouble and log in with the same credential for any kind of server, then please send the direct message to me. Uh, any questions before I start demonstration for Rob one and Rob two? And let's go for that. So the one bad thing is that because these screens are not working, so you cannot do the same thing while like, you cannot code it like that while you're watching the Zoom video in the full screen. So that's the one bad thing, but yeah, let's do that. So I will open the terminal. Can you see the terminal screen well? Yeah. So we will get into VMCTF2. There's an hacker man. Yeah. So let's get into week five. Oh, there's no challenge. <laughs> so if you run fetch week five, uh, it will give all the challenges. And then in here, we will start with the wrap 132. And then the challenge requires us to run set regi ID and exact V on this one. Yeah. And then let's take a source code. And then this is the part actually the making the challenge easier. Because there is no set regi ID set uh, or exact VE in the non randomized location. But if we call this function, then there is an entry that we can use in the binary program. And that's so called global offset table. But we will learn about the details of that in the next week. Yeah. So the important thing is like the, we know the address of the set regi ID and exact VE. Yeah. That's the point. And Let's attack it. And to do that, we need to first get the function addresses. Yeah. So to get that, uh, there are many ways, but uh, I will use uh, some uh, programmatic way. So let's run a, a Python, write a Python script. So it will do the horizontal split and then, then I will use the debugger. So I'll copy the binary as a I'll repeat three X. Rob one three X. <laughs> then what I will do is So in the input function, there's a read function, and then the buffer size is a 0x88. So we will put uh, 136 bytes, and then another four bytes, and then return starts. Yeah. So, and we will focus on how it returns. So we will set the breakpoint as the input function plus 155. Like this. Yeah. So I don't send any kind of thing. Then let's get Tmux first. Yeah. So now it uh, so it waits for my input. Uh, 
Then I put something like this, and then continue. Then it break at the return of the input function. So if we compose the stack and then put some of the value, then we can see how it returns. So this is the debugger setup. Yeah, and then what I will do is that we will have a tag payload. And then we know that Xerox 88 was the buffer length for up to the EVP. And then we need to override save the EVP like this. And then let's test that the, we can override the return address correctly. So if we see the one 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 as a return address, and then that was successful, run it, then continue. I believe I didn't send the input, <laughs> so that's why. So and then if I go too fast, and then please tell me, yeah. And then this is now recorded, so you can watch the video later. Yeah. And I need to send the payload. And then run it. Continue. That then now it breaks at the EIP at here. And then we know that the return address is one 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 one. Yeah. Then so we need to run. This first set a regio ID 50,000, 50,000. And then the reason, uh, the way how I can get the 50,000 is that. So the challenge binary is this one. And then it says week 5,000 solve. And then, hmm. if I search for that, uh, which I grab. So the group ID of this one is the 50,000. So I kindly put the 50,000 here to let you know about the group ID. So that's why you don't have to call get EGID because we know the target group ID. We can put the exact number for that. That's not changing. Yeah. So we want to call this. And to do that, we need to put. Address of the set regio ID. Pop up return, and then fifty thousand and fifty thousand. Then this is how we can compose the stack, because uh, if it returns to the set regio ID, then it will take these two as an argument, and then it will do pop up return, remove these two. And then what's matter is like the how can you get the address of the set regio ID and then pop up return. So let's get the address of the pop up return first. So we will do run the binary program wrap gadget. Uh, it's a script, I believe. Yeah. And then to the target binary. And then it will show a lot of the gadget like this. And then what I need is pop, pop, return. Where is it? Around here, pop, pop, return, right? So I just copy this. And paste to this. And then a pop return is this value. And then to get the function address, so set regid is it here, and then exec b is here, and then at this time I didn't run the binary program because we are not finding the function address in the library space. That's why. So just run with gdb, and then from the elf header you can fetch those kind of function addresses. So I will just copy these. Then 
address of the set regid is this one. Address of exec b is this one. And then I will release these four blocks. And then let's run it and how, take a look at how it goes. Ah, I need to remove one, 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 one thing. So this should be removed and it will start with the, this set regid payload. So, so it will run set regid, right? And then take a look at the ESP. So this is the address of the set regi ID. Yeah. And then the first argument is C350. And then second argument is C350. So that's actually calling set regi ID. Yeah. So in that case, it will get to all sort of the, this kind of the function call, the reserve, but you don't have to watch. And then just call return. Then yeah, so we can see that uh, we can set the argument correctly. So to get the debugger correctly, so I highly recommend to set the breakpoint at the pop pop return where some of the gadgets. So I will show how it runs after the calling of the set regi ID by setting the breakpoint at here. So I copied that address and then run it, and then set the breaker point at there. And then continue. So it will first return to set regid here. So I will just continue. Then it break that at the pop-up return. And then how it pops is like an EDI and EBP. So let's take a look at the value of the EDI. So C350, which is 50,000 in hexadecimal, and then EVP will get the 50,000, and then it will return to Lipsy start main. Yeah, but uh, that's because we didn't put anything about that. So the important thing here is that uh, it calls that regid and then clears up the arguments. So. What we will do next is calling exactly. So to call that, because we finish it one chunk of the block to call set regid, we will create another chunk of the block for uh, exactly. So we want to call exactly. But we don't care about the next function. So for zero. And then, what should be the first address, uh, first argument for the exec B is the string for the bin sh or something like that. But I will use some string because it does not have to be bin sh. Now we know the symlink trick. Yeah. And then this. Then exec B, some string, zero, zero. So this is actually equivalent to this. And then these blocks are equivalent to this function call. And then now we know that address of the exact B, but the, the problem is that the, where can we find the binsh or other strings? But you don't have to find bin sh or something. Then I will give you a hint. So run the program and then break the main. And then this is the context that the, our uh, actual program running will have. And then we can find any kind of string. So that ends with zero from here. And then 
there's a command called vmmap, and it shows that the memory mapping of the current binary program. And then we know that the, all these part are fixed, and we will try to find any kind of string that we can use it. So what I will do, so I will print out 100 strings from this address. And then there is a cute one, 8048028, that's string four. So if I put that address and then create the binary four as a SH, then it will run. Yeah. And then the address is not randomized. So if you try to find bin sh from library, that will be randomized per each time. So please don't do that. Fix any kind of string in the binary program, and then we can use that. So I will use that address, string number four is this one. Then put that. And what we need to do is create four as being SH in current directory. Yeah. And then let's run it. So we are at the return so it get into set regi id and then after running it it will run pop pop return and returns to exec b and then at the time of that we are at the exec b so the first argument is this one number four as a string and then second and third arguments are zero so this is how we can run the shell. So after that, I will remove GDB attach and then change it to our feed wrap 32, and then run it. Then you can get the flag. So any questions about this approach? Yeah, yes. So that's the content in the code. So think about the definition of the string. So we can use any kind of valid address that start with non-zero and with the zero byte, that's actually a string. So computers, CPU, library, they don't care about that's a character pointer or byte stream or integer, they don't care about that. CPU don't know about the type. So in the memory, so it has a ASCII value four, which is a 0x34, which is like the 52 in decimal value. So the intention of having that value is not having string four. Yeah. But we are using that as a string four because it's there. So the basically, we can use any kind of valid memory address as a string, but I just choose four for that. And then do you remember how I found that? Right, so no, no, not the disassembly. So attach GDB and then print out all the valid string from the start of the code region. And then I just choose one of the value, yeah. So to do that again, break and main, run it. So from the VM map, we know that code region started here and then ah, not ESP, my bad. We can use this as a string. We can use this as a string too, but we cannot type that number. So that's why I just choose the easy one. And then you can use any kind of the thing as a string. Yeah. 
like this. X S X is the examine. S is string. Any other questions? Then let's go for 64 bit. Yeah. Yeah. So conceptually is the same, but the operation is opposite because we need to set the argument first in 64 bit. And let's do that. And I will copy exploit binary to here. And I will start from here and change it to the 64 bit. And then, no, fix X first. I guess we need to take a look at the debugger. And then I will copy the binary as fix X. And then from the info function, we will set the breakpoint at here at the return of the info function to take a look at how it runs, 114. So our breakpoint will be 114. And also we know that the buffer size is a 0x80 and then RVP size is an eight. So what we will do is just a filling 88 bytes for the thing. And then here we will have a completely different prop gadgets. So I will remove all these. And then before that, I will test if the debugger works correctly. So I will put the 64 by the bit value, something like this, to see if this returns correctly to that position. Then continue. Then it returns to the this value. So we set up the debugger environment correctly. Then after that, we want to call set BGID 50,001, 50, 50, and then exactly some string zero, zero. And to do that, We will get the gadgets first. So run the wrap gadget on the binary. And then there could be some many gadgets. And we will focus on pop, pop, pop something. But the mainly focus on pop RDI, pop RSI, and pop RDX in these points. So I will copy these three lines. So pop RDI return is this one. Pop RDX, pop RBP return is, and then pop RSI, R15 return. Maybe, maybe I can name it like this, is this one. So how will I will write the payload is, So for this one, this, this is RDI and then this is RSI. Yeah. So I will set RDI first as 50,001 to do that. Return to pop RDI and return. Then it will set pop RDI, so RDI will become 50,001 and then return to the next. And then pop RSI, R15, return. So this will set RSI, and then next one set RDI, R15. But the, we don't care about R15, so I will just put zero, but you don't have to put zero. 50,001 is also okay. Any kind of value there. 
And then after setting these values, we need to call set regid to do that. We need to get the function addresses. Then I will put these at here. Address of the set regid is at here. Address of exec v is at here. So after setting two arguments, I will set address of set regid here. And let's take a look at the, how it works. So uh, I need to remove this part. I remove that. Yeah. So now it returns to pop RDI and return. And then when we get to pop RDI, so the first value on the stack is 50,001. So after running that, value of the RDI is 50,001. And then it returns to pop RSI and R15 are returned. Pop RSI, so. So it will run pop RSI. If I check the value of the pop RSI, then it's that's a 50,001 again and pop R15. So it became zero, but we don't care and return. And then it returned to set regid. And then if we check the register value, RDI and RSI is 50,001. So that's how we can set the argument first and then run it. And then next is doing that for exec VE again. So I will just uh, copy and paste all these things. And for the second argument, RSI, we want to put zero. And then for RDI, we want to put some string address there. And then we need to set RDX, right? Then, so we will use this address, RDX and RBP and return. So this is RDX and RBP. So we will set zero, zero for RSI and RDX. Then not the address of the set regid, we will run exec B. But in this case, we need to do the same thing for finding a string. Let's do that. Break a main and run it. Run William map. And we will start finding a string starting from here. So we will use this one at sign. Yeah, it's easy. So. Some string is it here? And it must be this one. Then it will use at. If you do that, we need to do the sim link at to be in a sage. All right. And let's see how it runs. So it goes to the return first, pop RDI. So it'll pop this one, pop RSI, it will pop this one. And then it will call set regid. Then it will pop RDI. So the RDI is now point to at, okay? And then pop RSI, zero. And then pop RDX, it will pop zero. And then at the time of the return to exec V, RDI, 
is this address. RSI is zero, RDX is zero, so it will run at as an EXECVE. So after identifying all of that, I will remove the debugger, run the challenge binary, then it works. Yeah. Any questions? So I will copy this two Python script into the week five. Uh, like uh, where where what what would be good? So the home labs directory. So you can refer to that, and you can work on the Rob one challenges, and then please solve Rob two challenges on your own by chaining three functions for open read write. Yeah, and then. Yeah, you might use like the for and add to a symlink to flag file to open that and read it. Yeah, and for Rob2 challenge, uh, please use any kind of address as a buffer address. For example, uh, so if you run break and main and then run it, run VM map, there is a global variable address which is a readable, writable, and then not moving. And then if you put At the start of the address, it will use some of the value, but some of the address like this are all zero. So you can freely use that address as a stretched space. So please read the flag into that address and then print out. Then you will have no problem in executing the, your ROP chain. And then it will use that as a free space. So what I will do is so get out from here, and then uh, so week five. Uh, I will copy that as a rob one thirty two exploit that high then. So if you go to home labs directory, then we five, and you will see these two Python script. So feel free to use these two exploit script as a base and then play with the editing the payload. Then you can solve the challenges. All right, let's start. Uh, exercise and then like uh, Lucas and I will help you uh, you guys for exploiting the rub chains. <laughs> 